same Holy Ghost, we may be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation to Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Padma, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Once again, for those who are attended to, and for the first time, for those who I haven't, welcome. Quite an interesting turn of events that brings us all up here. But as I'm often reminded when I'm having mass in an extraordinary situation, and my parishioners make the extra effort to get to the sacraments, I'm thinking, I can't help but think, God is pleased. And I can't help but think in seeing you all here and the sacrifices that you made to get here. And those who wanted to come here but were, were unable to make it, but are with us virtually, our blessed mother and her son are well pleased. With that being said, I would like to introduce our first speaker for this Fatima Conference. He's been an attendee, MC, speaker, worker, and a priest since 1986 at 51 past conferences. Pretty amazing. I think that he is the longest, or the most consistent um, since uh, we've started these conferences that have been to everyone. The pastor of St. Michael, a teacher, a lover of music, and the devotee of our Blessed Mother. Our, our first speaker will be talking about turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to heresy, the bane of our time. Please welcome to the lectern, Father Kevin Bruce. So, 
grandfather and I warn, uh, warned me not to bump my head on the seat. <laughs> we have a, a little platform here. Anyway, it's an honor to be able to address you at this uh, Fatima conference during the COVID year. And unusual that we're here at Mary Immaculate Queen Parish, City of Mary as we call it, but it is getting back to our roots. This was the cradle of CMRI and the beginnings of our parish here from the late 60s on. How many times have you asked yourself the question in frustration, why doesn't he or she get it? This talk is to help answer that question, why it's so hard for human beings to get it, to accept the truth, to see the truth. And very simply put, the truth is often difficult to accept. But the truth is what it is, and we must accept it, we must believe it. It is because we have a fallen human nature that we have such a hard time accepting the truth. And that's why it's easy to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to heresy, to falsehoods. It is because we are wounded in the begin, the very, be well, from the beginning of original sin. And we all inherit the condition of not only original sin, but the wounds that went along with it. That we have such a struggle with accepting the truth and listening to falsehoods instead. I would like to uh, uh, share a little bit of philosophy with you. Talk about what the greatest philosopher of the ancient era, Aristotle, and even St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, appreciates him very much when you look at the Summa Theologica, for example, and he says, the philosopher says, he's talking about Aristotle, because he came so close to explaining, well, he came so close to the truth, and most of what he said was exactly true, was not, uh, was not false in any way. So St. Thomas Aquinas appreciated that, and as I said, often uh, uh, quotes him. What I found very interesting is that Aristotle came up with the cardinal virtues. You all know it from your catechism, right? The four cardinal virtues. Let's see how you know how well you know them. Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. All right. So, uh, isn't that amazing? He died in 322 BC. So. 300 years before Christ, he had already understood human nature very, very well. I like to call him the world's first great psychologist. And he said he pointed out four different powers that we have, two in our rational nature, two in our sen sensitive nature, as he called it. And I won't have time to explain all that, but he said we need a virtue to perfect each one of these powers. If we don't practice the virtue, we will mess up our lives. So prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. We have to, to practice these uh, virtues in order to reach our final destiny. We have to, uh, uh, we, we we have to overcome sin. These virtues help us to overcome them. And uh, I can at least say this very quickly. Prudence perfects our intellect, helps us to use our intellect correctly. Justice helps us to use our will correctly. Fortitude helps us to, um, to perfect our, uh, what we could call the striving emotions, where we have mixed love and hate. And then temperance, helps us to perfect our desires, which are um, eat, love, or hate. So again, over 300 years before Christ, Aristotle explained the necessity of living these virtues in order to have a fulfilled, 
happy life. He said, true happiness comes from the life of virtue. It does not come from uh, just giving in to ourselves. And Aristotle did not understand, at least certainly not as, a, as Catholics would, you know, about fallen, the, the fallen nature and original sin, but he understood that we have these, this nature that has to be perfected. So, so far, so good, these four, uh, these four cardinal virtues. Now in the Catholic era, we find uh, better explanations. The church has kept these, uh, these four virtues, obviously, because it's absolutely correct. But St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, and he's quoting St. Bede the Venerable, talks about the four wounds of the soul. Four wounds. What are these? Well, these... These are the wounds, you might say, are the things that are going to be healed by these virtues. So here we have ignorance, malice, weakness, and concupiscence. So with the light of the gospel, we can understand even better about the four cardinal virtues. So again, Aristotle said you have to do these in order to live, a, to fulfill your destiny in life, to reach happiness, and understanding the effects of original sin, we find that we are prone to ignorance, not knowing, not wanting to know what we should know. We are prone to malice you know, doing bad things. And that is perfected by the virtue of justice, which tells us to always give to everybody what we owe to them. We all are weak. We know what we should do, but we don't feel like doing it. So we need the virtue of fortitude to, uh, to help us overcome our weakness to do the hard things that we have to do. We also have concupiscence, which is the, uh, the, the desire for pleasure, for, for its own sake, whether it's right or wrong. It feels good. I like it. I enjoy it. We need the virtue of temperance to say no to ourselves, especially when it's sinful pleasure. So getting back to the main theme of this talk, turning a blind eye to heresy and a deaf ear to heresy. In other words, just not, 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 not worrying about heresy. Uh, it is especially because of these wounds, and I would say here, ignorance. We naturally tend to not want to know what we ought to know. So we're not as rational and logical as we like to think ourselves. You know, during the 18th and 19th century, we had the age of rationality, of reason. You know, that, when we, that we will always do the right thing. You know, we, we can reason things out. We're all, we've all got this great logic. And then we find through the horrors of the 20th century that we're really not that logical and reasonable. Again, because we have these wounds. We are wounded as human beings, because of original sin. So we are susceptible to falsehoods. We can pick up on errors quite easily. Uh, I'm no fan of Mark Twain. You've all heard of him, right? Okay, he, he was really anti-Catholic. But, but some of the things he said were quite quite true. I, one of his sayings that I do agree with is, if you don't read the newspapers, you are uninformed. If you read the newspapers, you are misinformed. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> All right. So we are susceptible to brainwashing. Brainwashing, what is that? What is that? Uh, it's you as a tech it's a tactic used, well, I shouldn't say it's, it's brainwashing here, but 
you know, tyrants like to make use of brainwashing where they put people under very difficult circumstances and keep repeating something over and over again and because they're in that suffering, even probably tortured state, they're very susceptible to the communist propaganda. So that's brainwashing with, you know, the added, uh, what do you call it, you know, uh, duress added to that. We don't, we don't have that, but still in a sense, in a broader sense of the word, there's brainwashing that goes on because things are repeated over and over and over again and people pick up on that. By the way, this, isn't this what happens with advertising? I'm going to check your, uh, to see how well you, you're aware of some slogans right now. So, let's, uh, let's try a few examples. McDonald's. Finish it. I'm... I'm loving it. See, you're listening. Okay, the the slogan has been put out there. So, uh, Nike, just <laughs> Wheaties, breakfast. Of. You don't know this. Okay, Kentucky Fried Chicken, finger. Okay. Apple, think. Oh, you don't know that one too well. Think different is the Apple slogan, okay. United, fly, fly the friendly skies of United, okay. All state, you are in good hands. One last one, maybe more so than men here. Ford trucks are built tough. True, you know, it's still very good. Okay. Okay, now, some, many slogans are true, but many are not. But it's the power of the repetition that gets into people's consciousness. You can see, we just saw it, how that works in our own lives. So, uh, we have to be careful to look at the slogan and see if it's really true or not. Not just do it because we've heard it over and over again. Um, by the way, in, in one of the uh, logical fallacies there is is called appeal to shame, and that is when you buy a product because it was endorsed by a particular celebrity. I mean, what does that celebrity really know about that product? They were just paid to say, buy it. And so again, we are susceptible to just following these kinds of things. We tend to follow the crowd. No wonder our Lord called us sheep, because sheep are such big followers. Again, we are wounded. We tend towards ignorance, towards malice, weakness, and concupiscence. And it takes spiritual tools, it takes real effort to not or to heal those wounds and not be susceptible to falsehood and error. Our Lord came to lift up this fallen nature. I'm forgetting where it was said, but man had fallen so hard and so low because of the sin of Adam and Eve. He could never lift himself up. He could never ennoble himself, live up to the dignity of his human condition, which was really meant to be supernatural through sanctifying grace. But fortunately, God loved this fallen nature so much that he came to lift us up. He came to redeem us. And he gave us a church because we need this church. We need the means of grace to come up out of our fallen state. Our Lord said in John chapter 8, verse 32, the truth shall set you free. It is the truth that Christ brought to the world that dignifies us, sets us free, and helps us. By the way, in that same chapter earlier on, it, was, it starts off with our Lord and the, who had the adulterous woman brought to him. And his, our Lord's enemies thought they were going to confound him because, you know, here's this sinner, according to the Mosaic Law, she's caught, you know, committing 
her adultery, she should be stoned right there. You know, our Lord told them a third way that they hadn't thought about that completely confounded them. You know, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Also in that same chapter, we have the gospel that we read uh, on Passion Sunday every year. How our Lord says, you are not of, the, of God, you're not of the Father. You, in other words, you do not want the truth. You want to persist in your falsehood. So, again, our Lord came to set us free by giving us the truth. But the truth isn't always what we want it to be, but that doesn't matter. If it's true, we accept it, we believe it, that is what Christ came to teach us. I remember one of my parishioners from St. Mary's, uh, uh, God rest his soul, Bob Wolf, he had, he, had a very, he had very insightful sayings, and one of them was, people lose their minds in droves, <laughs> but they recover their sanity one at a time. <laughs> We have some other great sayings, and these are true slogans. Right is right, even if no one else is doing it. Another one that I came across that I thought was really great was, if you ever find yourself in the majority, it's time to change sides. <laughs> because so often, the truth is not what the majority is doing. When... Falsehood is preached by a powerful person, it has a profound effect. And the enemies of the church understood this. I'm sure you've read this uh, excerpt from the Alta Vendita, which was from uh, secret documents captured in 1846. But this talks about how the enemies of the church knew they needed to get somebody in the highest echelon of the church, the papacy even, so that they could truly do their evil work. They found that attacking the church from the outside did not produce results. So they'd have to worm their way in. And then when the falsehood is preached from the highest throne of the church, there is a much better chance of people accepting that falsehood. Of, you know, because the authority in the church said so. Uh, it's good to go over this quote from time to time, so let's, let's listen to it again. The Pope, whoever he is, will never come to the secret societies. It is up to the secret societies to take the first step towards the church with the aim of conquering both of them. The task that we are going to undertake is not the work of a day or of a month or of a year. It may last several years, perhaps a century, that in our ranks the soldier dies and the struggle goes on. We do not intend to win the popes to our cause to make them neophytes of our principles, propagators of our ideas. That would be a ridiculous dream, and if events turn out in some way, if cardinals or prelates, for example, of their own free will or by surprise, should enter into part of our secrets, that is not at all an inventive, or it should be probably incentive, for desiring their elevation to the Sea of Peter. What we must ask for, what we should look for and wait for, as the Jews wait for the Messiah, is a pope according to our needs. With that, we shall march more securely towards the assault on the church than with pamphlets of our brethren in France and even the gold of England. Do you want to know the reason for this? It is that with this, in order to shatter the high rock on which God has built his church, we no longer need Hanavalian vinegar or need gunpowder or even need our arms. We have the little finger of the successor of Peter engaged in the ploy, and this little finger is as good for this crusade as all the Urban Seconds and all the St. Bernards in Christendom. So this has been detailed in writings about the Alta Vendita, uh, definitely free, a Freemasonic uh, organization uh, or allied with the Freemasons. And these documents were captured, as I said, in 1846. So that's what they, they wanted to do. We have to have the falsehood preached from the top. 
And we see that that happened with Vatican II. There were 2,400 participants in Vatican Council II. Cardinals, archbishops, bishops, patriarchs, heads of superior, uh, superior generals of orders, of, of religious orders that were invited. And blatant heresy was taught in the documents of Vatican II. But once Paul VI put his signature to these heretical documents, and again, the primary her heresy, well, the primary heresies were false ecumenism, religious liberty, collegiality. Once he put his signature to it, then if you didn't, as a bishop, sign it, then you were not with the Holy Father. You were going against the infallible head of the church. So where was the outcry in 1965, 1964, 65, when these documents were signed? There wasn't the outcry. But 2020 vision, we look back, we look back, and we and by the late 60s, there were traditional Catholics who were saying, if that heresy, or since that is heresy, and it was promoted by the Pope and the bishops, then they put themselves out of the church through their heresy. So it was the master stroke of the devil and of his minions here on earth to have officially promulgated heresy the result of Vatican II. And then the downward slide continued. We, we saw horror after horror after horror happening. And, it's, and it continues. That's where it went off the rails. And Vatican II absolutely has to be condemned as a false council which means that the Pope who promulgated it had to be a false Pope. He couldn't possibly, the Vicar of Christ, and officially promulgate such, uh, such heresy. So, if he were a true Pope, of course, he would have never done that. So, the, the, it is true to say, obey the Holy Father. And again, this was the masterstroke to, to make it look like he was the real Pope, uh, promulgate all this and out of obedience you have to follow this and you have to, he's infallible after all isn't he but then you, you you start thinking things through and you realize he couldn't have been the true pope this couldn't have been the, the true church does not give heresy to its children the true church does not give stones for bread it can't it is the infallible guarantor of the truth But this is what's so difficult for people to understand. And when, when the heresy has been preached from the top, how easy it is to turn that blind eye and turn a deaf ear to it. Well, this is what the Pope teaches. Who am I to disagree? Another problem we face is that we do not have enough horror of heresy. And why should we have her a horror for heresy? Because, and it, it's, it, it hurts to even put it this way, but it, it makes our Lord a liar. That's why heresy is so bad. It's one of the greatest sins possible. But, you know, we all live in a very pluralistic society. You know, uh, freedom of religion. Uh, in our country, and that's become the standard pretty much, well, in most other countries. And so that promotes that indifferentism to the truth. You know, it's, oh, my good neighbor over here, he's a Jew. My, my nice neighbor over here is a Buddhist. The fellow across the, the family across the street, they're nice, nice, uh, nice Lutherans. And of course, it's not judging their souls. And we, we're, we're, you know, we, we're not in a position to, to do that, like God, God alone knows what goes on in a person's mind. But there's that indifferentism there. It really doesn't matter what religion you belong to, but that is pure heresy. Our Lord founded only one church, only one religion, not many churches. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one cometh to the Father except through me, our Lord teaches. You know, this, this sense of the, this horror of heresy was, is found, of course, in all the saints. But I'm thinking of this one example from the life of St. Francis de Chantal, um, who was a married woman, very holy woman, and after her husband died, she uh, became a religious and together with St. Francis de Sales founded the Order of the Visitation. But when she was a little girl, there, there, her family had a, um, uh, had a visitor come, and he was a Calvinist. And this was only like within a hundred years of the Protestant revolt. So, uh, so anyway, for whatever reason, this man was visiting her family. And as a young girl, again, shows her, her innocence, her holiness at that age, she heard him say, Jesus is, the, the, Jesus is not present in the Holy Eucharist. She was horrified by that. And she began to refute him, saying, you don't say that. And to, to, to quiet her down, the, the man gave her a piece of candy. Here, here little kid, you know, <laughs> have this piece of candy. She marched over to the fireplace and threw it into the fire and says, that's where people go who deny the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist. <laughs> Why did she say that? Because she understood the evil of, of that heresy, of denying the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. I think this quote from Father Faber is so good. Uh, it's from his book, The Precious Blood, 1860. And this is what he writes. Now, this is not official church teaching, but this is definitely one of the approved authors uh, very and just so well put and I believe he was a convert from from Anglicanism himself but this is what he writes then again the crowning disloyalty to God is heresy it is the sin of sins the very loathsomest of things which God looks down upon in this malignant world yet how little do we understand of its excesses, excessive hatefulness it is the polluting of God's truth, which is the worst of all impurities. Yet how light we make of it. We look at it, and we are calm. We touch it, and do not shudder. We mix with it, and have no fear. We see it touch holy things, and we have no sense of sacrilege. We breathe this odor and show no signs of detestation or disgust. Some of us affect its friendship, and some even extenuate its guilt. We do not love God enough to be angry for his glory. We do not love men enough to be charitably truthful for their souls. We can dwell amidst this odious plague in imperturbable tranquility, Reconciled to its foulness, not without some boastful professions of liberal admiration, perhaps even with a solicitous show of tolerant sympathies. We have not the antique sternness. Our charity is untruthful because it is not severe, and it is unpersuasive because it is, un it is, because it is untruthful. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this, but... He, but you can see how eloquently he, he makes his point. But here I'll, I'll close with this sentence. Where there is no hatred of heresy, there is no holiness. So, very powerfully put. It really makes you think, objectively, heresy is a most horrible thing. Now, we, of course, as St. Augustine would say, we hate the sin, but not the sinner. We don't hate the heretic, but we, out of true love, we have to try to bring him to awareness of his heresy. So, uh, one of the methods used, besides the fact that, you know, from the top down by a purported pope heresy was promulgated, uh, other things are used that... Uh, to justify Vatican II, and I'm sure that you have heard these many a time, but I'd like to make a short list of some of the slogans used uh, for us to become part, you know, wh why aren't you part of the, of the Catholic Church? Okay, so, um, as a matter of fact, let it be worthwhile, I think, to put some of these on the board.
Okay, the first one, the first slogan, and these are, by the way, erroneous slogans, there's error in them, so we definitely want to understand that. You're not with the Pope. Okay. Okay, how do we answer that one? Actually, we can use a short slogan to refute that. Um, one of them would be, I'm more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> Or, I'm Catholic and he's not. <laughs> All right, so, so false slogan, you're not with the Pope. Yeah, if he was the Pope, we would be lining up to submit to him. We believe in the papacy. We just don't accept um, uh, imposters. Okay, and, and what was amazing is so many of the R&R, &R, the recognize and resist people say, he doesn't have the faith. We have to convert him back to the faith. <laughs> but he's the Holy Father. I mean, the absurdity of it. The absolute absurdity. So again, our, our, short, uh, our, our, our short true slogans uh, I'm, more, um, I'm Catholic, he's not, or if he's a Catholic, I will most certainly submit to him. Okay, next slogan, how can so few of you be right? Um, and by the way, I would welcome any... any uh, contributions to this, but I'm just trying to come up with my own responses that I've used many a time. I'm sure you've also used them. My answer would be, numbers have never been the determinant of truth. <laughs> okay? It's it never... Uh, we don't go by the numbers. What's the majority doing? That's the true thing. Most of the time, they're wrong. Okay? Uh, here's another one. You're stuck in the past. What's a simple one that we could use to refute that? Well, the truth doesn't change with the times. Yes, which, which shall, was it ever shall be. Okay, now I'm going to give you a very long quote now here from Vatican Council One, that is the absolute clincher. And I'm sorry I don't have time to write it out on the on the board, but I can tell you, if you want to look it up. Session 3, Chapter 4. This is the absolute clincher for those that say, you know, things can change. Listen to this. For the doctrine of the faith which God has revealed is put forward not as some philosophical discovery capable of being perfected by human intelligence, but as a divine deposit committed to the spouse of Christ to be faithfully protected and infallibly promulgated. Here it is. Here it is. The absolute clincher. There's no refutation, there's no response possible. Hence, too, that meaning of the sacred dogmas is ever to be maintained, which has once been declared by Holy Mother Church, and there must never be any abandonment of this sense under the pretext or in the name of a more profound understanding. It just can't happen. It never will happen. So that's the longer quote you can use, who say the truth changes with the times. Okay, uh, number four, you don't have a, the authority. How many times have you heard that? You don't have the authority to be doing what you're doing. Okay, simple answer to that one would be, well, I would... I would ask a question. Do, do this next time somebody tells you you don't have the authority. Say, do I need authority to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4? <laughs> and what would they say? Well, of course you don't need authority. You're just recognizing the truth. Bingo. That is what, that, that, there it is. We don't need authority to recognize the truth. We have the obligation to recognize the truth. And when I see that 
the teachings of Vatican II and post-Vatican II contradict previous teachings, that's not an act of authority, that's an act of using my eyes and using my ears to see the truth, and then I have to choose accordingly. You don't need authority to, to, to see the truth and to follow the truth. You have the obligation to do so. Um, another one is, I like the new Mass. <laughs> Although as many good people that were scandalized by it and left it, um, but there are unfortunately many that say, oh, I, I like that. Well, a short answer to that is Cardinal Ottaviani, former secretary of the Holy Office in 1969, wrote to Paul VI, his famous letter, said this is a Protestantized liturgy. So there, you're, you're, you have, you're following a Protestantized liturgy. I wish I had time to write out the counter the, uh, arguments here, but again, our time is limited. Um, and then finally, here's another one about what's happened in the church. It can't happen. And we would use then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where St. Paul says there will be a great falling away and the man of sin will be revealed. He will give himself out to be worshipped as though he were God. So it's right there. There will be a great apostasy. The falling of the word used in the Greek for falling away is apostasia. So uh, you can translate it as the great falling away or the great apostasy. This has happened. So it is difficult to bring people to the truth. Again, we, we realize that we have this wounded nature, and of course, it doesn't help that the devil is whispering in people's ears, right? <laughs> Trying to, to you know, get them to keep following their, their fallen human nature. The world is beckoning. Our spiritual enemies are against us, but still, the truth is not impossible to reach. We have to reach it in order to save our souls. So it's difficult to bring people to the truth, but we have to have hope. I was blessed with wonderful parents who were such good Catholics. And long story short, they were refugees from communist Lithuania. They escaped from two different parts of the country. They met actually in this country. But uh, they, they, were, they lived for about three years under Nazi occupation and a year and a half under the Soviet occupation and they knew their families were scheduled to be deported. So they were able to escape uh, and uh, they, they recognized the evils of communism always and they could see this communist liberal, uh, you know, tendency and they were always very keen about that because they suffered from it. And when the changes came, my parents recognized it early on and we, we left our parish in 1967, 68, even before the Novus Ordo. We kids, my two sisters and I, we didn't understand, but of course parents make, are making the decisions for their children. And then we moved to northern Idaho and uh, 1970, we, they built a house just down, about a mile down the road from here. And um, the, uh, and then living their Catholic faith, their traditional Catholic faith, they also had a great uh, desire to help their fellow Lithuanians in this country and in other countries of the world. And at their own expense, basically out of their own pocket, they were they were printing a bulletin called Stella Maris, Star of the Sea, all in Lithuanian, and they were just, you know, putting the word out to um, you know, to anybody that they knew that was Lithuanian, and uh, they probably got some donations from time to time, but for the most part, it was out of their own pocket. And I can remember licking many a stamp, <laughs> you know, get the mailings out. And my mother's there, she's saying, say a short prayer for each one of these stamps you put on, you know. And even struck me back then, you know, it seemed like such a fruitless effort. Because 
you know, my parents thought that you know, having experienced the horror of communism, the ones that escaped, they would understand better. But it seemed like they, most of the Lithuanians, the vast, vast majority, they were all going for Vatican II. And my parents kept up their effort for about some 10 years. And then my father died in, a, uh, in an accident in 1980. And, and my mother was accepted into CMRI as a religious sister. It's kind of a unique situation, but she had a true second calling. But for about 10 years there, they were really working hard to try to bring their fellow Lithuanians out of Vatican II, and they saw so little fruit. But remember, we're planting a seed, and, and I can see years later that they were planting the, the results of that. I, I do remember one of the Vatican II nuns did leave, at least for a while, in 1974. So unfortunately, they, her, her order pulled her back away. But at least for a while, Sister Mary Bernarda was traditional Catholic. Uh, I found out later from a man who is a, a Lithuanian man who, um, who I just met, a, well, saw a couple of years ago. Um, and he, his mother was on, his parents were on my parents' mailing list. And he said, yeah, I remember growing up, all these good bulletins that your parents were sending out. I was thinking, wow, you know, after 40 years, it's great to hear there's some kind of results. You know, so they were planting the seed. And uh, even some of my relatives, um, they became a lot more favorable to the traditional Catholicism, although they were condemning us as a cult. And, you know, and, and having, well, they were, list, they were victims of the slogans. You know, got to do all this. So remember, we are planting seeds, and we have to do everything we can to help encourage that. Just in the last week, I've got, I got calls from two women in New York City, or New York, state of New York. One of them this very morning from Long Island. She had seen two of our nuns blocking the, the, the street somewhere on Long Island. She went up to them, made a quick connection, found out they were traditional Catholic. And just this morning, she calls me, you know, uh, are you connected with those nuns? Uh, what were they doing there? I said, I don't know. <laughs> they were there. But you, you see the power of the religious habit? And she's asking me these questions, what do I do? She said, Father, I hate to tell you this, but the Pope is evil. <laughs> I said, you're right. <laughs> And so I was able to put her in touch with one of our priests out on the Pope Father Laterno. He knows better where she be, she can go to church. But she, she said, I, I couldn't believe my ears. The, the priest is quoting Father James Martin. <laughs> no disorder watches correctly identified him as Hellboy because of what he's be preaching. And she says, you know, what do I do? I stopped going. So here you have somebody who's. You know she's Catholic. There's good people like this. And last week I talked to another lady, very similar circumstances. You know what's interesting too is the parallel between what's going on in Novus Ordo and in the political realm. Yeah. If any of you looked at the hashtag walk away, I would encourage you to look at those videos. They're available. Walk away. And it is Democrats. Who, former Democrats who said, I, you know, I, it's the same thing. I've listened to the slogans for all my life. I started to do my research. I realize that it's not true what, what you know, I've been told, and I'm walking away. And, I mean, every, almost everyone you click on has got a really great story. So people are walking away from the evil position of the Democrat Party. And people are walking away, thank God, from the evils of Vatican II. They are no longer turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to the heresy. They want to be Catholic. So what can we do? Meditate and do mental prayer. That helps to get rid of false ideas. We have false ideas in our minds. We have to, through prayer and guidance of the church, get rid of false ideas. And on a, on a,
prayer level to do that through meditation. It's very, very helpful. Offer up prayer and sacrifice. As Our Lady said at Fatima, there's so many who perish because you don't offer up the prayers and sacrifices. That always opens people's eyes spiritually and opens their ears in a way that other things will never do. Reach out in firm conviction and in charity. St. Francis de Sales was reputed to have personally converted somewhere between 70 and 80,000 Calvinist heretics. Now he was a bishop, that's his duty to do that, but they could sense his charity. There was a saying, if, if, if St. Francis can be so charitable, so loving and, and, and trying to reach us and pull us out of our problems, of our heresy, how good God must be. So we have to do it with charity. And yes, my dear brethren, we are in the minority, but remember, it was only a minority at the foot of the cross that they had the truth. Let us stand in union with Mary, and that's how we'll be able to persevere. God bless you. Thank you, Father. You notice how he was looking more this way. I was trying to walk that way. He doesn't take it personally, though. It took about a 10 minute break until uh, our second conference. So please be back at your place. You might start a little bit late. Um, As you take your seat, <clears throat> sorry, something in my throat. I'd like to tell you about the restroom situation. There are restrooms over here on this side of the hall, and restrooms over here on this side of the hall, and there are penny buckets outside for your convenience. Our second conference. The second lecture for this conference is taking um, us to the next step, collaborating with Father Catherine's conference. We were instead of the con, instead of the consism. Thank you. And our speaker, I think, was the first priest that I ever saw ordained when I was in second grade. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, either I'm really young, or Father is very persevering. <laughs> a true devotee and promoter of our Blessed Mother, lectures across the country throughout the years, many years, and contributed to the Reign of Mary, and now it's editor, that is the periodical uh, of the congregation of Mary Macrocrine, steadfast and perseverant in the traditions of the church, a teacher in the traditional major seminary and the founder of St. Joseph's Minor Seminary and pastor of Mary Magdalene Queen and our host, Father Benedict Hughes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the um, websites that I check regularly is called LifeSite News. How many of you are familiar with LifeSite News? Well, they had a news article uh, last night because you know who Gavin Newsom is? 
So his uh, health department in California came out with something yesterday. When you're in a restaurant, you are to put your mask on after each bite. So you take it off, take a bite. And this is absolutely dead serious. This is how they think. And then you put it on, chew it. You know, you ready for another bite? Take it off. So. All right. Uh, you notice in your conference program that the title of this lecture is The Case for Sated Vicantism. Because even though that's been covered many times, Father Kasmer covered it quite a bit in his first lecture this morning. Uh, at the same time, it's been probably a number of years where we had a lecture devoted to just this topic of how do we arrive at the conclusion. Now, I know that most of you, if not all of you, arrived at that conclusion long ago. But you may wonder, well, how can I explain it to someone who asks me why you don't follow the Pope, as Father put it, or why you think he's not a true Pope? So I hope to be able to give you uh, some pointers that you can use as a rationale to try and help other people who are still uh, benighted in the Novus Ordo Church or even in the r, &R movement and still believe that this man is Pope. And I want to begin by making a reference to and commending and commending to your prayers the recently departed priest writer, Father Anthony Chikaya, because I will be using a number of his articles and especially a wonderful little booklet he wrote that looks like this. Um, you can get it at our bookstore at the Mount. You can also read it free on the internet. I can tell you where you can find that. Um, and many other articles. He's been one of the foremost defenders of the Sede Vicantis conclusion over the last 30, 40 years. And has written, again, a number of excellent articles. He had uh, quite an ability to write uh, a wit and an ability to explain in a simple way. So he did a great deal of good, and we should all remember to pray for the repose of his soul. He passed away uh, just a month ago on the 11th of September. Now, I want to begin by defining or explaining where we come up with that term. I don't know who came up with it, Zeta Vicantism, ah. but the important thing is we understand what is the meaning and why that term is used. I don't necessarily think it's the best term, but it, it kind of like Father talked about labels, it has stuck. So people refer to us as Sede Vacantists. Mm -hmm. And there, the other term that's often used is R&R, &R, which we'll get to. Uh, so I have in my hands here uh, a Missali Roman. This is the book the priest uses to say Mass. Obviously, it's a small uh, printing, printed edition. But in the front of the Missali Romanum, there is a decree entitled Ritus Servandus in Celebrazione Mise, the right to be observed in celebrating Mass. And it has this rubric. And it says, Ubi dici, where it says, Una cum fabula tuo Papa Nostra, Nostro so-and-so, where it says the name of the Pope, exprimi nomen Papi, sede autem vacante, verba predicta omituntur. So where, when this chair is vacant, then the priest omits those words. So maybe that's where it came from. But I do know there was a great priest in Mexico. He was a Jesuit, Father Sáenz, Father Sáenz Yaniaga, who was a mentor for our own uh, great benefactor, Bishop Carmona. And Father Sáenz, to my knowledge, was the first one who came out, at least in this hemisphere, to came to the conclusion that Paul VI at that time could not be a true pope, and he wrote a book and the name of the book was Sede Vacante. So all of this is by way of explaining the term that is used. And it is a term that is used for all of those faithful Catholics who have come to the conclusion that the chair is vacant, that we cannot accept the men in the Vatican who wear a white cassock, who go by name Pope so-and-so, and that would include, beginning with John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul I, John Paul II, Benedict the 16th, and now Francis. So all of them, we see because of their heresies, that they were not true popes. 
Now, let's take a minute before we get into that and the argumentation to quote from sacred scripture on the papacy. We want to understand what is a Catholic concept of the Pope, of the papacy. And what we will find is, based on the quotes of scripture, that the part of the faith towards the papacy, that is, is a love, a reverence, an obedience, and a sense of complete submission to the Pope. And why is that? Because you could put it this way, the Pope is your link to Christ. The Pope is your link to Christ. Because our Lord said to St. Peter, and this is a you know, quote that you've heard many times, after the apostles had gone out on their first missionary journey, and they came back and they were gathered together, and Jesus, having come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, began to ask his disciples, saying, Who do men say the Son of Man is? But they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And we can imagine there was a pause. You know, all of them kind of afraid to say. Maybe been thinking about it, but didn't want to publicly say what, and maybe they weren't sure in their own mind. But it says, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to me, to thee, but my Father in heaven. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. There are a lot of things that we could, we could unpack that, that entire quote and look at a lot of different aspects. For instance, the keys. Who is the one that has the keys? He would either be the owner, the master of the city, or the castle, whatever, or his steward, who has his trust. So St. Peter has the keys of admitting or refusing to admit to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever he binds on earth will be bound in heaven. And as our Lord, our Lord said to all the apostles on another occasion, and specifically to Peter, he who hears you, hears me. So, uh, you know, the name Peter comes from the word Cephas, which means a rock. Thou art, thou art Peter, thou art rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. So the papacy, we could say, is the foundation. It reminds us of that other time in Scripture where our Lord said, if somebody's building a building, he's not going to build it on shifting sand. Otherwise, it will crumble and fall. But he will build it on a solid foundation. So our Lord built his church on the foundation of the papacy and protected the papacy with infallibility and also primacy. Now, one more quote I want to give you. And this one is from St. Luke uh, regarding St. Peter. And this took place at the Last Supper. You know, St. Peter was protect, protesting. He would never deny his Lord. He would go to death with our Lord, etc. And the Lord said, and this is from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith may not fail. And do thou, when once thou hast turned again, strengthen thy brethren. So our Lord is telling St. Peter, warning him, he's about to fall. He was too confident in himself that he would never betray our Lord. And our Lord said, once you have turned, once you have turned back, you've been converted, then strengthen your brethren. Now our Lord promised at Caesarea Philippi that he would make Peter that the head of his church. Upon this rock I will build my church. And then he fulfilled that promise after his resurrection at the third apparition to the apostles gathered together at least a good number of them took place in Galilee 
at the Sea of Galilee on the shore. And the apostles were out fishing, and they had caught nothing all night. And then all of a sudden they saw a figure on the shore in the early dawn. And it was our Lord. And he said to them, put your nets down on the right side of the boat. And they did so, and they gathered together this large uh, catch of fish. And they came to the shore, and subsequently they had something to eat. And then subsequently, St. John tells us, our Lord asked St. Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Feed my lambs. And then he asked him again, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Feed my lambs. And then he asked him a third time, and this time St. Peter was becoming a little nervous because he thought, is there something in me that I don't know that Jesus sees that is defective? Why is he asking me a third time? He said, Lord, thou knowest everything. Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. So we have lambs, lambs, and sheep. Well, who are the lambs? We are all the lambs, all the faithful of the church. The sheep are the apostles, the other bishops. So St. Peter is the bishop of bishops. He is the head of the church, and he is to feed even the other bishops with the doctrine of truth. So we say that on the shore, that's when Christ established the primacy, or gave to St. Peter the primacy of his church. Now, Father Casimir was quoting from Vatican I. I would also like to give you a quote. Uh, the, the dogmatic decree, Pastor Eternus, was approved in, on July 18, 1870. And it was interesting because there was a war going on uh, and troops were coming, Rome was being surrounded, and they had to hurry up and finish Vatican II. Vatican II. Vatican <laughs> Council, the Vatican Council, Vatican I. So Pope Pius IX thought, well, we have to cover what really is the main reason why we're having this council, and that was on the papacy. And so the dogmatic decree on the papacy was approved, the last order of business before the council dispersed and the bishops went back to their own countries. So I'll just read a section on the papacy from Vatican I. Thus then, as he sent the apostles whom he had selected from the world for himself, as he himself had been sent by the Father, so in his church he wished the pastors and the doctors to be even to the consummation of the world, but that the episcopacy itself might be one and undivided, and that the entire multitude of the faithful, through priests closely connected with one another, might be preserved in the unity of faith and communion, placing the blessed Peter over the other apostles. He established in him the perpetual principle and visible foundation of both unities, upon whose strength the eternal temple might be erected and the sublimity of the church to be raised to heaven might rise in the firmness of the faith. And since the gates of hell to overthrow the church, if this were possible, arise from all sides with ever greater hatred against its divinely established foundation, we judge it to be necessary for the protection, safety, and increase of the Catholic faith, that with the approbation of the Council to set forth the doctrine on the institution, perpetuity, and nature of the sacred apostolic primacy, in which the strength and solidity of the whole church consist, etc. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful uh, document. You can read the whole thing, but in the course of that document, the Council teaches that to the Pope is not just given a primacy of honor, meaning he is given a primacy of honor, but not that alone. There's also the primacy of jurisdiction, that the Pope has authority over not only all the bishops in the world, but every single one of the faithful. And again, he is our link to Christ. Our Lord said to St. Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And our Lord said, I am with you, Peter. I am with you until the consummation of the world. Well, Peter wasn't going to live forever. In fact, he was martyred in the year 67. So how is our Lord with him until the end of time? And that couldn't mean with him in heaven, because he will be with him also after the end of time in heaven, right? 
So he says, I am with you, Peter, until the consummation of the world. He is with him in his successors, the successors of St. Peter. Now, I was saying this is so important an issue because the papacy is our link to Christ, our submission to the Pope. And what are we accused of very often? You're schismatic. So let's talk about that. What does schism mean? It means a refusal to submit to a true pope or to the body of the faithful, to, to be united to the body of the faithful. But it works two ways. If someone refuses to submit to a true pope, he is a schismatic. He is outside the Catholic Church. He is outside the path of salvation. But also, if someone submits to someone who's not a pope and treats him as a pope, he is a schismatic. And they don't think about that. If they're submitting to a man who's not a pope, then they're taking the loyalty that belongs to the papacy and they're giving it to an imposter. So materially, they are schismatic. So uh, I just want to bring that up because it's not thought about very much. So we have the quotes from scripture and we want to understand why is this question important? Because a lot of people will say, you know, it really bothers me what Francis says and what he does and what these other popes of Vatican II have done, but I don't know. I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to worry about it. You know, the, the, kind of the attitude of, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to remove myself from this discussion. I'm not going to think about it, uh, and that type of thing. Why is this question important? Because, again, it would be schismatic to submit to someone as pope who is not a pope. Uh, you know, one of the many arguments that are used against judge the pope. But as Bishop McKenna so beautifully put it to me once, in such a few words, he had a way of, you know, of explaining things. He said, I'm not judging the Pope, I'm judging whether or not he is a Pope. <laughs> and, and that's very, really very profound. Because you have to make a judgment whether or not this man is a Pope so that you will know whether or not to give your submission to him, your obedience. And again, Father had these other sayings or accusations that are made um, when people used to ask me back in the days when I would travel around in lectures, well, you're not with the Pope. I would say, well, I'm with the 262 Popes from St. Peter to Pope Pius XII inclusive, and therefore I'm, I'm rejecting the last four or five at that time, four, uh, four or five. It's one or the other, because their position on dogmatic issues and moral issues is in complete contradiction to what the true popes have taught for nearly 2,000 years. Now, Father gave a quote on Freemasonry. I was also going to give a couple of quotes because we need to understand that Freemasons, understanding what the papacy is, that it's like you might say the linchpin that ties everything together, that the enemies of God, the minions of the devil, they know that too. So they've always sought to get control, to get their own man on the chair of Peter. And so I'll just give you a couple of the quotes. This one is taken from the Redecki Brothers' first book. Uh, and it is a quote of a Freemason in 1862. And his name was uh, Elif Levi, 1862. Quote, a day will come when the Pope, inspired by the Holy Spirit, will declare that all the excommunications are lifted and all the anathemas are retracted. When all the Christians will be united within the church, when the Jews and Muslims will be blessed and called back to her, she will permit all sects to approach her by degrees and will embrace all mankind by the communion of her love and prayers. Then the Protestants will no longer exist. Against what will they be able to protest? The sovereign pontiff will then be truly king of the religious world, and he will do whatever he wishes with all the nations of the earth. It is necessary to spread this spirit of universal fraternity. So that, that's one quote. I'm going to give you some more. And I, I mentioned this book at a past Fatima conference. This is a fantastic book. It's called No Crisis in the Church? Question mark by a man named Simon Galloway, uh, English, British man. And I think it was written in 2011. And uh, the Society of St. Pius X advertised it. They were promoting it. And their bookstore out of Kansas City had it. 
I ordered 20 copies right away uh, and sold all, all of them. I have one left. Um, but uh, then it's out of print now, and you can't get it anyway. I've tried to find it you know, on the internet, and you can't get it. Uh, I think it led to too many converts to say the continent. <laughs> the irony of it is this man points out all the heresies of these modern popes, but because he's an adherent of the SSPX, or at least at the time he wrote it, he still remained part of them and their, and their thinking. Now, if, he may have changed. Has he changed since? Oh, Father, could you just say what SSPX is for some of the new people? Yes, Society of St. Pius X. And, and I'll come back to that later. But in this book, he has a lot of quotes, but in the back there's an appendix with a number of quotes from Freemasons. I'm going to give you a couple more. Again, this is, this is so that we understand that Freemasonry has always sought to get control of the chair of Peter, to get their own man there so that thereby they could destroy the church from within by obedience. In fact, this is quoting from Father Paul Kramer's book, The, um, the Devil's Final Battle. He says, quote, we will destroy the church by means of holy obedience, unquote, is a famous Masonic dictum. They want to use the obedience. Catholics have this sense of obedience to our bishops, to our pope. We're going to use that against us by getting, up, getting Catholics to obey a false pope, a heretical pope. Here's a couple more. This one is from the Grand Orient Freemasonry Unmasked by Right Reverend Monsignor George Dillon. Quote, the pope, whoever he may be, will never come to the secret societies it is for the secret societies to come first to the church in the resolve to conquer the two. That which we ought to demand, that which we should seek and expect, as the Jews expected the Messiah, is a pope according to our wants. Uh, here's another one. This one quoted from the New Montinian Church by Father Science. He, quote, the pope, the, uh, quote, he, that is the pope, must pro proceed someone who earns the world's admiration and should be a person to whom the world will pay homage in place of their redeemer. This is a matter of demonstrating perfect accord between the ideology of modern civilization and the ideology of Christ and his gospel. It will be the consecration of the new social order and the solemn baptism of modern civilization. And that was a quote by Abbe Roca, uh, a Rosicrucian Mason, as quoted in Father Simon's book. And two more. Uh, this one is from the Masonic Chief of the Supreme Council in 1845. Quote, the priest Gioberti talks to the clergymen in their own language. This, that, he's a priest who left the priesthood, apostatized. Uh, this priest talks to the clergymen in their own language. And I am pleased to tell you that we are introducing the doctrines of liberty and Italian independence everywhere, with the Pope taking the lead. And we have won over many members of the clergy, both secular and of orders. They have literally convinced themselves that Catholicism is essentially a doctrine of democracy. Now, this is when they thought that Pope Pius IX would be favorable to their plans. And he turned out to be their, the hammer of liberalism and Freemasonry. One last quote. Um, this one is from Carlos Vasquez Rangel who was the Grand Commander of the Supreme Council of the Masons of Mexico. This was in an interview he gave in 1993. Quote, on the same day in Paris, the profane Angelo Roncalli and the profane Giovanni Montini were initiated into the august mysteries of the Brotherhood. Thus it was that much that was achieved at the Council, Vatican II, was based on Masonic principles. So they can be pretty open about it. But again, we have their their words to indicate what their program was, what their plan was. And if they could just get their own man on the chair of Peter, then they could destroy everything. Now, John the Twenty-Third um, is was a transitional character, meaning he succeeded Pope Pius XII, but he wasn't an out-and-out -out heretic like Paul VI was. Although I like that quote, I don't like it in the sense it's a good quote, but I mean it really explains who he was. Someone asked him, what kind of a pope will you be? And he said, well, think of what, how Pope Pius XII would have acted, and I will do just the opposite. So, pretty interesting quote. But John the Twenty-Third 
was supposedly pope for four and a half years. He died in June, I think, of 1963. He only published five encyclicals. And two of them are thoroughly Masonic. One is called Pacem in Tibis. And here's a quote from a Masonic dignitary and Swiss diplomat, um, as quoted by Father Luigi Vila. Quote, he, John the 23rd, is a deist and a rationalist. He will change many things. After him, the church will never be the same. That's amazing. Uh, here's another quote. This one's from Salvina, the Grand Master of Masonry, in 1970. Quote, John the 23rd recently published a document which on this subject comes very close to our position. And Mater et Magistra, another encyclical he wrote, as well as Pacem and Teres effectively present ideas very suggestive of a humane rapprochement among different ideologies. And there's a lot more quotes from Freemasons on John the 23rd. I was just last couple days preparing for this lecture reading through Pacem and Teres. And it's interesting that John the 23rd, that was published in April of 1963, so before the documents of Vatican II were promulgated. And in that encyclical, he talks about the fact that everyone has a right to worship God however he chooses. It's what's called religious liberty, and that was enshrined as supposed Catholic teaching by Vatican II, its document on you know, freedom of worship, religious liberty. So John the 23rd was saying that before that document was written and promulgated. Uh, so he was very Freemasonic in his thinking, and we could go on through all of the false popes. You know, John the 23rd, I had shown the seminarians a lecture recently, and John Paul II, as you know, was the supposed pope for something like 32 or 33 years, and in that time he traveled all over the world and engaged in uh, common worship with every sort of uh, other religion, you know, not just Protestants and, and the Orthodox, but Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and Jews and everyone you can imagine. But John Paul II, in one of his, his encyclicals, uttered an incredible heresy. He said, by his incarnation, the Son of God united himself with all of humanity, with each and every man, in a union that is to last forever. Now, by the incarnation, the Son of God took to himself a human nature. That is a particular body and soul, not humanity. But what does that mean if you think about it? John Paul II's teaching that the incarnation means that the Son of God united himself to all of humanity in a union that's going to last forever. That means everybody goes to heaven. Because Christ isn't going to be united to someone in hell. So, and they believe, they all believe this, that everybody goes to heaven. I remember Father Oswald in one of his lectures saying, it's the engine that drives the train. They all believe in universal salvation, but they won't say it. But the higher-ups believe in that. Now, um, I talked about the fact that John Paul II, you know, has, was, was involved in common worship with every sort of, uh, of erroneous uh, religious teaching, uh, even to the point of going into the synagogue in Rome, the Jewish synagogue in Rome, and he's sitting there while they're saying a prayer, waiting for the Messiah to come. What a betrayal of Christ, the man who's supposedly the successor of St. Peter, the vicar of Christ on earth. And of course, to top it all off, John Paul II um, called for the first uh, prayer meeting in Assisi. That was in 1986. And he wanted representatives from every religion in the world to come together so that they could pray together for peace. So acknowledging that their prayers are just as pleasing to God as ours. And modernists, we've gone over this many times in the Fatima Conference, modernists believe that every religion, whatever form it takes, starts from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the author because he inspires this religious sentiment that then expresses itself in different ways because of the culture. And so that's pure modernism. And I, we could go through Benedict the Sixteenth. I'll just say one thing about him. I remember at the funeral of John Paul II, Benedict the Sixteenth gave communion to, I think his name was Brother Roger, 
Toots, I don't remember his name, the, the founder of Taizé, this, this ecumenical uh, community in France, in eastern France, and gave him communion. And then the same Brother Roger, a few months later, was tragically murdered by a woman who had mental health issues, and she went up and stabbed him to death, right, in his uh, community. And when Benedict XVI heard the news, he said, Brother Roger is looking down on us from heaven. He is a perfect example of the ideal of ecumenism. And I say this because some people think that Benedict XVI was this, this paragon of, of um, orthodox thinking and teaching. Anything but. He was the main author, one of the main authors of the documents of Vatican II. And it was pathetic to listen to his continual de defenses of Vatican II. And one of the last ones, before he resigned, what was it, uh, March, maybe March 1st, or February 28, 2013, I believe. And one of his last uh, speeches was before the priests of Rome. And he said, the problem with Vatican II is not the council, it's the news media. They have distorted what the council really taught. We need to get back to what it really taught. Well, it, it really taught heresy. That's what it really taught. So I say this by way of pointing out, Benedict XVI is not in any way, shape, or form some paragon of orthodox thinking and teaching. Um, there are conservatives who have this idea that Francis is a false pope because Benedict XVI's resignation wasn't valid. And so therefore, he's the true pope, kind of, you know, hidden away in the Vatican, so at least we've got a true pope there. And it's, it's, um, it's foolish, because, of course, Benedict XVI has acknowledged Francis as the pope, and so forth. So, We've gone through the importance of the question. By the papacy, we're united to Christ. We've gone through the fact that some quotes from Scripture and understanding of the papacy, and that the Freemasons have always sought to destroy souls, to destroy the faith, by trying to get the control of the papacy. And we also had a couple quotes of theirs on how happy they were at the revolution of John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth. Now, Father Chicada wrote this wonderful booklet, um, and when he explains the papacy to bring it down, I mean, the state of occultism, to make it, bring it down to a simple level, he's saying, as Father Kasmer pointed out, the church cannot give evil. Our Lord said, he that is baptized and believes shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Well, are, are we supposed to take everything that a pope says and examine it and think, Gee, can I believe that or not? No, you, you just can trust. If he's a true pope, you accept it. So what do you do then when someone who supposedly is a pope is uttering every kind of heresy and permitting every kind of sacrilege under the sun? So he points out, well, the church cannot get e give evil. So either the person who is doing this doesn't have true authority, or maybe he had it at one time and lost it. And I'll give you, in the back of this booklet, he has an appendix with a lot of quotes from theologians. Here is one from St. Robert Bellarmine in 1610. A pope who is a manifest heretic automatically, per se, ceases to be pope and head, just as he ceases automatically to be a Christian and a member of the church. Wherefore, he can be judged and punished by the church. This is the teaching of all the ancient fathers, who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. One more is St. Antoninus back in 1459. In the case in which the Pope would become a heretic, he would find himself by that fact alone and without any other sentence separated from the church. A head separated from a body cannot, as long as it remains separated, be head of the same body from which it was cut off. A pope who would be separated from the church by heresy, therefore, would by that very fact itself cease to be head of the church. He could not be a heretic and remain pope, because since he is outside of the church, he cannot possess the keys of the church. And again, numerous other uh, theologians. Before St. Robert Bellarmine, there were different opinions. But he settled it, because these theologians thought, well, it would never happen. But could it happen? If it did happen, that a pope was teaching heresy, then what? And the, the consensus was, and has been, especially since the time of St. Robert Bellarmine, 
he would automatically, ipso facto, lose the papacy. Now, I don't believe that these characters, since Vatican II lost the papacy, I don't think they ever had it to begin with. Because one of the conditions to be validly elected a pope is that the candidate or the person elected has to be a member of the church, has to be a Catholic. And you find out that their thinking was heretical before they were even elected. Now, one of the things that we have talked about before, uh, the bishop has talked about this, regarding heresy, or re regarding infallibility. Uh, there's a couple problems there that what people understand or think or teach. One of them is a pope is only infallible once every hundred years or so, <laughs> you know, which is absurd. Another one is that he's only infallible when he teaches you know, dogma, and that's it. Well, the council fathers at Vatican I pointed out that there are what they call secondary objects of infallibility. In other words, infallibility protects a pope in other areas. One of them is a true pope could not promulgate a liturgical practice, right, liturgical law that would be harmful to the faith or detrimental to souls for the universal church. He couldn't promulgate a novus ordo, in other words. It would be impossible for a true pope to do that. Another one, secondary object of infallibility, is a pope is infallible in canonization of saints. He could not declare that someone is in heaven who's not in heaven, because then you'd have the faithful praying to that, that lost soul. And so, uh, as example, how could John Paul II, for example, after everything he did, how could he be declared a saint? And same with John XXIII and Escriva and others. The third area that is a secondary object of papal infallibility is discipline. A pope could not promulgate a law for the universal church that is harmful to souls or offensive to Almighty God. So, for example, John Paul II in 1983 promulgated a new code of canon law. And in that code it says, if a non-Catholic comes up to a priest and professes that he is a has a faith in the Eucharist and wants communion, the priest must give him communion. The priest must give him communion. And I thought that was very interesting because remember when Bill Clinton was president, he was in South Africa, and a Novus Ordo priest gave him communion, and the conservatives you know, were all up in arms about this, and the priest said, I'm just following canon law. John Paul II's canon law. So a true pope could not give you a law that would be offensive to God, detrimental to souls, etc. So those are what we call the secondary objects of infallibility. Uh, as I said, St. Robert Bellarmine treated the question of whether or not a heretic could be a pope. And if he was validly elected and then fell into heresy, he would lose, ipso facto, the papacy. Now, um, those who oppose us on Sede Vicantism, they will quote or use uh, supposed cases where a pope fell into heresy. Uh, maybe Pope Liberius, Pope Honorius, Pope John XXII. There are a few of them. Now, the fathers, that means the bishops who were present at Vatican I, especially Cardinal Manning, one of the great uh, doctors of, of the faith at the time of Vatican I, first of all, before the definition of infallibility, wanted to investigate any historical uh, incident where a pope had been accused of being an error. And they found that in every case, he was not. He had not transgressed, had not taught error. And I don't have time to go into that. There are many good articles written about that, refuting the claim, the accusation, that there have been heretical popes in the past. But all of these defenders of the R&R &R position try and hang their hat on something like that. Well, there was this bad pope, or whatever. And all of them have been refuted. Now, I mentioned the R&R. &R. So it very likely was Father Chicago that came up with that uh, term, that label. Stands for recognize and resist. And that means all of those conservative or would-be traditional Catholics who say that Francis is a pope. We don't like what he says, we ignore him, uh, on and on and on, but he's the pope. I don't like it, but he's the pope. Reminds me of one woman who said, 
well, I have to go to the Novus Ordo because the Pope promulgated and I hate it. I hate every minute of it, but I have to go. Does that make any sense whatsoever? So uh, the R&R has uh, a number of proponents, and one of them is a man named Christopher Ferrara, who writes, I think, for The Remnant and, and wrote for, um, for uh, the Fatima Crusader. And Father Chicada wrote an article uh, refuting an article by Christopher Ferrara, and it's entitled Sede Vicongism and Mr. Ferrara's Cardboard Pope. Because the R&R, &R, what they want, they want a pope that they can just put his picture in their church and every now and then say a prayer for him and then they're all good. You know, and then ignore everything he says, disobey him. So regarding the Society of St. Pius X, they say he's the pope, but they totally ignore him because they have established a worldwide network of chapels, of priests preaching, hearing confessions, and so on and so forth, without any regard for the local bishop, whom they say is a, is a true bishop. They've even defended the validity of their orders, and above him, the so-called pope. So they say he's pope, but they turn around and just totally ignore him, and in fact, disobey him, and set up their own virtual hierarchy and uh, apostle. So it, it, it's contradictory. Uh, so the R&R &R is the idea that traditionalists can say, you know, I, I, they can talk till they're blue in the face about all the errors of Francis, or, you know, Benedict XVI, or John Paul II, etc., Paul VI, um, but they say, but he's Pope, and they feel that, you know, that they're fine. Now, speaking of Francis, just to, uh, he, he just came out uh, last week, with a new encyclical. Now this is interesting because he hadn't published an encyclical for five years. And so this one, Fratelli Tutti, in, in Italian, all our brothers. And the whole thing is on, you know, humanity, kind of Freemasonic principles of, of brotherhood, etc. And he laments certain evils, like poverty or whatever, but he doesn't mention abortion, he doesn't mention homosexuality, you know, he doesn't mention those. And speaking of homosexuality, I hate to say it, but but just to point out, this is in the Reign of Mary that was just published. You know, in the back, the news section, little little news stories, that Francis called a nun in Argentina a month or two ago. And this nun is called the nun of the trans in Argentina because her apostle is among the transsexuals. You know, men who want to be women, women who want to be men, etc. She she works with them. So she recently built an apartment building that has 12 units for men who think they're women. And, and get this, and their partners. And Francis called her and said, thanks for taking care of my girls. That's what he said. And he was referring to the men who are now claiming to be women in there. I mean, he is anything but a Catholic. He's not even Christian. You know, it, it is so incredible how far things have gone. But Francis, of course, is famous, or I should say infamous, for these kind of cold calls. So there was, remember when he published uh, an apostolic constitution on divorce and remarriage, was, was basically what it's about, the family. And he called this extraordinary synod, and they had two sessions to try and get the bishops to, to approve this so there wouldn't be come back on him. So they finally published this long, and all of them are interminable. The, the encyclical published last week is 287 no. paragraphs. It's awesome. uh, at any rate, this uh, one on, what, what was it called, Amoris Laetitia, uh, in there it's in a footnote that sometimes a person who has been divorced and remarried outside the church could be given communion. So they kind of, it's not in the documents, it's in the footnote. You know? So they, they always have this out. Um, incredible, incredible. But uh, after, about the time that was published, it came to light that there was a woman in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he's from, who is divorced and remarried outside the church, and her pastor refused to give her communion. Francis called her and said, just go to another church until you can find a place that can give her communion. And then it doesn't come back in him because say, well, if it's not written anywhere that he said that, you know, they always excuse him. Another problem with those of the R&R &R is that they're always moving the goalposts. 
And what I mean by that is, have you ever heard people say, well, if he does one more, you know, heretical thing, I'm out of here. You know, he's not a true pope. One more, and then one more comes. Well, well one more, one more. So Archbishop Lefebvre did that. When John Paul II announced that he was going to have that infamous prayer meeting in Assisi, which I think he had two of, and then Benedict XVI had one after him, the supposedly great traditionalist Benedict XVI. When he said he was going to do that, in October of 1986, Archbishop Lefebvre, Lefebvre said, if he really goes through with this, I'm probably going to have to declare that the Pope is not the Pope. That's what he said. And then he went through with it and, well, well. you know, moved the goalposts. So something worse than that, then it'll be, you know, proof. So that, that's something that happens. Um, it has been more than 60 years since the death of Pope Pius XII. What will it take to wake people up? We must pray, and as Father mentioned, this, uh, how did you put it, Father? Bob Wolf's statement that you can, uh, people are, are misled in mass, but they're converted individually, singly, and that's really true. Because I get emails through the CMRI website from people all the time who have woken up, who have understood. We're, we're the real woke people, you know, that understand uh, saving the contest, right? So people are waking up, and uh, I mentioned arguments used against us, false ideas of infallibility, that a pope is only infallible once a century or so. Some, here's another one. Well, if he's not the pope, who's going to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary? It must be done by a pope. As though, because we want the consecration to be done, we have to accept an absolute heretic, a non-Catholic, because otherwise there's no pope to do it. Uh, another one was, how are we going to get a pope if he's not the pope? And Father Chicada actually, in one of his appendices, goes into that, the different ideas in that regard. Uh, another one is, well, there can't be an interregnum for this long a time. Who says? Who says? We have to face the reality we have today. And the reality is these men, since Vatican II, can be in no way, shape, or form true vicars of Christ, representatives of St. Peter, images of Christ on earth, his vicar on earth. They're not even Catholics. We must reject them and adhere wholeheartedly to what the true popes have taught for nearly 2,000 years. Again, from St. Peter to Pope Pius XII, we study their encyclicals, their writings, their speeches, etc. They are the true popes, not the modern pretenders. Let us remain loyal to the papacy because it is our link to Christ. Thank you. I was talking to Father Gasmer after his talk, and one quote came to me from, I was reminded of his talk, St. Teresa Avila, during the time of Western Schism, where someone says, you don't even have all the churches when you need all the people. Aww. And she said, when God's on my side, we need the majority. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the attitude we have to have. Um, at noontime, we will have our we will have the Angelus and the Sovereign Mysteries of the Rosary and Church Confessions during the Rosary. Lunch will be on your own. We ask you to please pray individually, but it, it, it will not be served until 12.30. And our first lecture of the afternoon will begin at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>